<laughs> You're drinking champagne on a Thursday at uh, what is it? 11 a.m. Why not, man? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is hilarious. <laughs> you know, How are well, you? introduce yourself. Oh, I'm great. I'm Vanessa Conlin. Uh, I'm a master of wine and uh, had the pleasure of uh, meeting Dean, I don't know, two weeks ago, something like that through a mutual friend in yeah. Los Angeles. And yeah, uh, yeah. At, at Cut. At Cut, which I believe is one of, if not your favorite restaurant. Well, my favorite uh, steakhouse of all time, favorite for sure. Steakhouse. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, and also for multiple reasons, you know, one being the room, uh, the the decor, the music. But of course, uh, Wolfgang, you know, like the, the guy's a legend. You know, I, I like I like legends, you know. Yeah, my I don't know how much of this you caught, but my favorite part of that whole evening was uh, when he he gave us a kitchen tour. And he was using your phone to take pictures of you, you know, managing this massive tomahawk steak over the grill. And you guys are hamming it up and hamming it up and hamming it up. And finally you stop. And I, did you see there were like 12 chefs that like ran over and were like pulling everything off the grill frantically? And they were like, it's all burned. <laughs> so, <laughs> he didn't even care. He was like, get in care. there. Get closer care. to the fire. Get closer yeah. to the fire. <laughs> I got the, you're, <laughs> my favorite <laughs> leather jacket on and I'm worried about like steak grease splatting on it or catching on fire. So anyway, I hope your your photo op was worth it because I think you wound about 12 people's dinners that night. So uh, yeah, uh, good job. It was <laughs> it was about us. It was a dream come true, man, just to hang out with that guy. And I mean, I've uh, eaten in there uh, for years and it's always amazing to me that he would just spin over to the tables. He's like, is everything good over here? And you're like, what? Yeah. he's fucking here. You know? Yeah. <laughs> like, Not only there, I think he sat down with us for like 20, 30 minutes. It was great. The stories he was telling was insane. Yeah. Andy Warhol was my friend. You're like, oh, what? You know, it was just, <laughs> oh, my God. Now, let me uh, talk to you a little bit about uh, I know zero about wine because uh, in my drinking days, I didn't care for wine. And, um, and growing up in the Bay Area, I know some of the greatest wine is up there. And now I yeah. don't drink at all because I uh, ex diabetes and stuff and and kind of miss the whole. Uh, I, I feel like this is how funny it is to me. Once sideways hits, oh, yeah. all of a sudden, it seems like everyone was talking about wine from that day on. There was just, just this red hot for like two, three years. Oh, dude, we're going to Santa Barbara. We're going to try the Pinot, blah, 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 you know? And yeah, and that, that was really, of course, wine's been around since uh, in most people's minds, God, you know? Yeah, yeah. So- how do you become an expert on wine? And uh, let's get into your story a little bit. And what does that mean and your job and all of that, the whole thing? Yeah, for sure. Well, you know, I did not grow up in a, in a family that had wine either. I mean, my parents love it now because I give them re really good shit, but, um, but they're both uh, classical musicians. And I think they couldn't afford it for one because they were kind of starving artists, but it just wasn't something that that we had, you know, at the at the dinner table. I think, you know, maybe once a month they'd have a dinner party and maybe they'd like pick something up at the bottom shelf of the grocery store or something like that. So I didn't know anything about it. Um, and I also studied um, classical music. So I, and I love I love all types of music. I love blues. I love soul. I love classic rock. But like, you know, this is what I grew up around. And so I never really imagined doing anything else. And I certainly didn't know that there were careers in wine yeah. that were, that yeah. even existed, you know, Other than I, being in like Italy, you know, stomping on grapes or something. Yeah. Like if you owned a winery, maybe, you know, other than that, I was like, I guess you could be a bartender. I don't, I don't know, you know? So I, I didn't really discover it until, um, until I was already in my twenties, I went to school in New York city, uh, at Manhattan school of music. And, you know, like a lot of struggling artists, I had to wait tables. And I realized like, wow, you know, this is really cool. Plus your, your check gets a lot higher. <laughs> oh, yeah. If you know, if you know how to talk so, about it. So they're table. tipping on the t whole check. Yeah, I get right, it. Wow. Right. 
but, um, but really there was something that, that really fascinated me, um, because a lot of the way that I would hear people talk about it, who knew wine, they were using terms that I would hear, or, or I would use talking about music, you know, like harmony and balance and, you know, and like notes, the way, right. Notes of this notes of that. Exactly. You're exactly right. And, and also, you know, it's using your senses, you know, you know, you go to a concert, whether it's classical or rock, or whatever, like we're using our senses to appreciate something and we can be right beside each other. And we're going to have two different experiences because we're not the same person. Right. Um, and it was just, you know, it's the same with wine. Like, I know you don't drink, I know you don't drink wine, but if we both sat here and had a glass, like you are going to experience it and taste it and remember it in a way that's completely different than me. And I think that's so fascinating. So there was something about it that I really it just made my ears prick up, but, you know, I was still singing and, um, traveling a lot. And so I would start exploring it, particularly if I was like in Europe, I would try to, you know, taste all the wines and, and all that. And then, um, I had a break between gigs and when I was in New York. And so I thought, you know what, I'm going to go just take a class, like an amateur one on, you know, one one wine class. And I, I thought my head was going to like pop off, you know, just like everything that goes into making a bottle of wine, it's fascinating. And so I just came home and I am, I'm a, I'm kind of a dork. I love to take notes and stuff. And I came home, I had like pages and pages of notes. And I just thought like, I, I, this is it. Like, you know, and again, I love music. It wasn't about like, oh, I, uh, I'm giving this up because I don't like it, but I was like, wow, you know what? Actually, I don't have to do this myself. I can be in the audience and love it and go explore this other thing. So basically I just started at the bottom. I took like a minimum wage job at a retail shop just to like be around the buyer um, and a wine shop, a wine shop on wow. the Upper West side. Yep. Oh, yeah. yeah. And just so I could like taste and hear them talk about it. And um, it just kind of took off from there. So I worked my way up and ended up managing that store and then another store. And then I was the buyer for a wine bar. Uh, and then eventually, you know, I really needed to take the next step, which is that I had never worked like at a winery or around vineyards. I'd always just been in the city, like selling wine, you know, on, on the floor. So moved out to Napa Valley in, in 2010. And, uh, that's, that's where I'm talking to you from yeah. right here. Yeah. Sitting in Napa. So it's funny growing up in the Bay area, I was around wine all my life and you would do stuff like, uh, go on the tour of the champagne factory out there and, uh, by Guerneville, what's that place up on the uh, hill there? Well, there's Shramsburg is like my favorite in the North coast, but there's mom, there's, um, there's Domaine Chandon. There's this one's Domaine on the way Carneros. to Guerneville. It oh. looks like a castle. Oh, I know what you're talking about. It has like a German. Yeah. Uh, oh, it's right on the. Yes, I know exactly what we're talking about. It's right on the tip of my tongue, but I, I'm blanking on it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, you know, I, Scharf, I, I, Scharfenberger? Is that right? I, I, I can't remember, but okay. I do remember going there and, you know, drinking the samples. And there was one thing I found out right away. I must be allergic to a champagne or something because. The next morning I woke up, it felt like someone kicked me in the side of the head. It was the worst hangover I ever had. It was just like, oh, how do I get rid of this? Mm -hmm. But, you know, and then you would go to Napa. That was a thing that yeah. that women love to do. We're going to go wine tasting and they get all cuckoo in there. But I, I would go on the tours. It was fun and, and fascinating. You see these giant barrels and everything. but some of my favorites was um i think about four years ago my friend uh is friends with the coppolas and we went out to their winery and uh yeah they were like looking at the wine and everything and i was fascinated by that upstairs of all you know well oh, apocalypse now the godfather uh, desk there's the surfboard you know because i love coppola but I did start hearing a lot about wine once Coppola starts hitting back in the day. Cause when Coppola starts selling wine at first, I think the industry is like, what? And you know, they were doing some kind of hybrid of the two different types of grapes or whatever. And he starts smashing it. Right. And, and, and winning prizes and people are like, Whoa. And now he is like one of the Kings in the industry. And I do believe, I think I'm not sure if I'm right. His wine first came out. Was it a screw off top? It might have been. I mean, there, there's, there's, a, there still remains like a bit of a stigma about that. But actually, the screw caps have come a really long way. That's what I, I heard. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can get really the same quality in a cork, and then you don't have to worry about things that can happen to a cork because it's a natural product. So sometimes, you know, things can go wrong. Yeah, 
Yeah. Now, also, there was a cork shortage at, uh, at one point, I think. And then, you know, but it is funny, like, you know, growing up around uh, the ghetto wines of like Night Train and those things, those. Now, do you uh, have you ever drank Night Train? It's weird and, and insane. I have I have I have to say I've not had Night Train. <laughs> what? It's I, I wanted to ask you if you knew anything about those like gut. What are they? The, the term is like gut rot wine. Gut. Yeah. Uh, rot gut. Rot gut. Yeah. Yeah. They are the most weirdest alcohol in general is weird because I think at first when everyone drinks it, no one goes, this is fantastic. You're a kid. You're drinking soda the whole your whole life. You love like root beer and grape soda and orange crush. And then you get into booze and you're like, ooh, and you, you know, so you you gravitate towards like schnapps and stuff that tastes kind of fun. But yeah. it really takes a while to get into wine. Did you like it at first, the taste of it? Um, now, keep in mind, I was really basically an adult when I first had it. So I, I did. But um, but you're exactly right. But I think if you look at particularly the American diet and there's so much sugar, like even when you don't know that there's sugar in what you're eating. And so it, it makes sense. We don't have the same experiences um, as other people do in their their cultural cuisine of like bitter or astringent or acidity, you know, which is all stuff that can, or, you know, savoriness that's part of in your beverage, um, which is all part of, part of wine. So yeah, that's a lot of people's starting place, you know, Moscato or some, some other type of, of sweet wine. Um, but, but this is not to say that I haven't had like inexpensive wines, like to, to pass the master of wine exam, you're expected to know all types of consumers because there's wine for everybody. Right. So like you can, I had, you know, yellowtail on my exam, I had Dom Perignon. So you really have to know <laughs> yeah. everything's out there and, and all types of consumers and, and different price points. So you start working at a, a you moved to uh, Napa and you start working at uh, a vineyard. Which one did you start working at? Yeah, my very first job was at a, a winery that I still love called Arietta. Um, so it's a family owned winery, but um, amazing, amazing opportunity. I was the first employee that they had ever had that wasn't, you know, part of the production process. So I really got to, to learn all parts of the business. It's a lovely family. And they happen to have a, like a very famous consulting winemaker too, named Andy Erickson. So it was, it was just an awesome jumping off place. Um, so that, that was my start. I worked for a place called Donna estates, um, for many years too. And now, now I am the head of wine for a, a national retailer called, uh, wine access, but, um, but all during that time I was studying. So, you know, from the time I took that first class, it's just like amateur class in New York. I started taking classes and then I started doing like the more serious professional classes in New York and was still doing that when I came out here and then finally started the master of wine program after I was already living in, in Napa Valley. What I love about your story is you were pursuing one thing and then completely said, nah, I'm going to start over and pursue something else. I, I often preach this over the 11 years of the podcast of if you don't like what you're doing, or you think maybe you want to try something else, I firmly believe that you should because you can always go back and do what you were doing instead of sitting in something and going, you know, I should have really tried some other stuff over my lifetime, you know? Yeah, no, you're, you're so right. And I think you'll, you'll understand this um, is that, you know, also, you know, I was singing, I had gigs, but like, I was never going to be super famous. You know, I wasn't going to get a record deal. So, um, you know, I, I loved it, but I had to be honest with myself too, you know, and say like, wow, this other thing is really cool. I love it. Do I want to just keep doing this because I know it or because my parents are going to be disappointed yeah. <laughs> that I'm not, you know, that I'm not doing it. Um, and, but it wasn't, it, it wasn't easy either. You know, it was like, for me, it was such a part of my identity, my entire life. Like, who am I? I'm a singer that's who I am. You know, that's how my friends know me. That's how my family knows me. Um, I spent a lot of money going to school for it. Um, but, um, so it was, is almost like I had to, I had to get to a point where I was had to sort of say goodbye to it. Like it was a dear friend. And yeah. there was, a, there was a sadness to that too, you know? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, you know, because there is that inner claw, that inner feeling inside of you of like, did I give up or, but I don't believe that. I don't, I don't believe people give up on their dreams i think they uh obtain other dreams in life and and then if they don't pursue those other dreams then it becomes a swirl of emotions like yeah. ah you know i 
I always knew I wasn't good enough at this and maybe I would have done it. So, you know, uh, my whole life, I felt like I should do comedy, but I also loved music and it was uh, what I knew the most to get into. There wasn't kids doing comedy where I was in the neighborhood, you know, but there's kids yeah. playing music. So yeah, music is very uh, attractive at a young age because it's the arts and uh, and then you get into it, you realize there's so much to it. There's writing songs, there's writing lyrics, melodies, there's grinding it out, finding other uh, bandmates or whatever kind of thing you're trying to do. There's mostly with music, I would say uh, about 75% of it, you need other people involved, you know? Yeah. So then you have to rely on other people's work ethic and their, their girlfriends and boyfriends or whatever their problems are in life. So yeah, it's, it's a really gnarly road. Yeah. yeah. I have a question. So you said you were the first to work at this winery as a, a non-maker. So how does this happen? You go out to Sonoma and you're like, all right, I want to get into the wine world. Are you knocking on doors saying, I'll just do anything? What's happening there? Yeah. It, it, well, so I was trying to apply to things while I was still living in New York. So there's this website called winejobs.com. So you can probably tell what that's all about. So I was looking at these jobs in Napa and I'm calling people up or sending me my resume, you know, and they're like, okay, yeah, let's like have a follow up. Can you come in tomorrow? And I'm like, well, I'm, I, live, I live in New York, you know, but really I'm going to move out there. And then they'd be like, click. Yeah. Um, you know, and so finally one day I was just like, I just got to go, you know, and you know, that like that phrase, like leap and the net will appear. Yeah. I just thought that's what I got to do. So I moved out here. I had um, my air mattress and my cat. <laughs> wow. Did you drive across country? <laughs> I I I did fly with my cat, which was another experience. But oh, you um, didn't have a car, right? Because you're I in did, New York. I had never owned a car in my life. Wow. Did you grow up in New York in the city? I grew up in Texas and then Virginia and West Virginia, mostly before before New York. But I just never I just yeah. never owned I never owned a car. So um, yeah, so I came out here and then like basically all of a sudden everything dried up. I'm looking on that website and I'm like, there were like a hundred things last week and now there's nothing. Oh. Um, and so, no, you know what I did? I took a job at the tasting room of Robert Mondavi. Wow. Great. Just, I was like, let's do this. But it was a great experience actually. Cause you see so many people coming through and you learn to tell the story of Napa and you know, how to, how to tell people about wine and anyway. And, and honestly, I had never had this wine Arietta, but I was a musician. And of course, Arietta means like little song. Yeah. And I was like, I, I got to meet these people. So basically I like, you know, introduced myself to like talk to myself into having, you know, coffee and I left with the job. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Now at the time, uh, how many years ago was this? That was 2010. I moved okay, out here. So, so yeah. 2010, the amount of how Sonoma and Napa area has changed from 2010 to 2022. I mean, it's straight up high baller now up there. Oh yeah, you know, it's like Disneyland for adults. Yeah, it really is. I mean, perfect example too is like Bottle Rock Festival. Oh when yeah, when that came around, I was like, a festival in Napa. You know, I, I get it, great theme, Bottle Rock and stuff. But I was like, are there enough people up? Oh yeah, there's people out there, and you know, it kind of goes from like Marin County. And then you got Petaluma and Sonoma County all the way up to Napa. And that whole area is just kind of money now and, yes. and fine wines and foods and farm to table. And it really is this kind of boutique world of all kinds of good stuff that people are making and, uh, and, and, you know, cooking and all of that up there. Right. Totally. And, and it's, very expensive too. Oh, so like God. land, land in Napa, you can pay up to a million dollars for an acre. Whoa. For a acre. Yeah. A million for an acre. It's crazy because, um, I mean, that's not obviously the high end, but it's, it's not out there. It's not too far off. So like, basically, you know, Napa Valley for good reason is protected by the agricultural preserve, which means it's limited. Um, that's why we do, you don't have these big strip malls in the middle of Napa Valley and stuff, right? It, so it protects, it protects the land, but it limits how much you can plant. Um, and particularly how much you can plant on hillsides because of erosion. Um, so basically like Napa is essentially planted out. So you can't plant here. You can't be a new vineyard owner unless you're taking it from somebody else. Right. Right. And so right. it's just drives up, drives, it drives, it drives it up. 
you know, and then, um, you know, I think obviously there's amazing, beautiful wines out here, but you look at some of the price tags on these wines and you're like, well, no wonder, I mean, look at what you had to pay for, <laughs> pay yeah. for the land. Yeah. Well, I was just reading recently and a few things have happened. Of course, the massive fires over the last five oh, years yeah. up there has affected the price tag. And then just re recently I was reading the, uh, the supply of, of wine bottles. There are none right now. So there's another problem. It's, it's, it's honestly nuts. Like, yeah. So you're exactly right. There's a uh, kind of two major fires right here in Napa Valley, but then of course, all around us too, in, in other years, but 2017 and then 2020 was the really devastating one here. Um, so a lot of people won't have wine um, that they're going to release from that vintage, but, but yeah. And then COVID hit and like other industries too, it's like, you can't get bottles. You can't get glasses. You know, the, you can't get uh, labels. You can't get corks. You can't, it's, it's, it's just crazy. Yeah. yeah. It seems like hey, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but it, it seems like every industry is like, all right, we missed out on two years of money. So let's just say everything's hard to get and we'll just <laughs> triple the price of anything. Used cars, uh, you know, wine, yeah. uh, watches, any luxury items, Porsches, you know, <laughs> it's just like, what? Who knows? And then of course, also, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, work for a wine retailer. So we ship wine all over the United States, but we're very reliant on a lot of wines coming in the country from Europe and to get something through a port. It's crazy. I mean, it's getting a little better, but these ships would just, you know, just sit off of the port of Oakland for like two months, three months. Cause there's just nobody to unload them. That's crazy. Right. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now let's get into it. So you're working at the winery, you mm -hmm. start at the tasting room, then you go and you start working at this uh, winery. And at what point do you say, all right, I want to study. And is there like a, a school or how do you, you know, how do you get ready yeah. to take this, uh, this, uh, the master, master wine. class? Yeah. 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 So I had done all of the levels that I could through a program called the wine and spirits education trust. So I'd finished that while I was here and I was honestly a little burned out. And I was like, I think that's probably it. This is as far as I'm going to far as I'm going to go. Um, and so I was just working. And then I remember being, starting to be around conversations, like particularly when around winemakers and they were talking about things that involve chemistry or, you know, things that I was like, I don't really know what that is. And so my brain started humming again, and I'm just a very curious person. Like I need to always be like learning, you know, what's, what's the next thing I can kind of feed my brain with. And so, um, so I reconsidered that and I was lucky enough to, to know some people who had gone into the master of wine program. So I, I talked with them. Um, but, uh, you know, you, you have to apply to get admitted to it. You take an exam, um, to be admitted to it, to it. And then it's, um, it's a minimum three-year process, but could take up to seven. Um, and then there's about, so the first exam was in 1953. It's an organization based out of the UK. And since 1953, there's been fewer than 500 people to, to pass the exam. So it's wow. a, it's a, it's a serious commitment. You have to be really ready to annoy all of your friends and family a lot. So you sit down and you take this, uh, how long is the, uh, the test and, and how many questions is the questions or are you drinking stuff and, and they're asking you questions what's going on there? Yeah, both. So it, there are several years, um, it's called like stage one, there's a stage one assessment. So you have to pass that, or you have to repeat it, or they kick you out at that point. Um, and then at that point, if you pass through stage one, you become eligible to sit, like, I'll just call it the big exam. So it's, it's essentially a four day exam. Um, and half of it is theory. So all written, everything we do is in essay form, even our tasting notes about wine. So it's uh, all day writings about things like, you know, viticulture. So, you know, the growing of grapes, vinification, meaning the winemaking, there's things about law, um, current events, um, uh, the handling of wine, health, uh, anything, you know, that, that they want to throw at you, but essentially it's a, it's an exam that's about critical thinking. So it's, it's not an exam. The master of wine exam is not an exam that you're just memorizing flashcards. There are, are, there are certifications that are like that. And they're really hard too. but for this one, what made it interesting is you have to kind of pull in your knowledge of all aspects and then form an argument. So you're almost going to like argue like a lawyer. Um, and, uh, like you're going to use, you're going to be a detective and then you're going to argue your, your, your case. And you have to understand both sides and then ultimately come to a conclusion. So that's the, the theory portion. And then the tasting portion, we call that the practical exam. And that's three days. 
And over the course of three days, we taste 36 wines blind. Whoa, so, whoa. you're Uber and home on those. Days, huh? <laughs> well, we, we, we spit, we spit the wine out when we're, when we're oh. taking an exam uh, or assessing like as a professional, I mean, I'm, I am sipping a glass of champagne right now, but mostly if I'm assessing wine, uh, you know, for my job, I'm, I'm spitting it out. Um, 36 wines. Yeah. And you're yeah. blindfolded. You're not blindfolded, but when we say blind, it means that you just have a glass in front of you. No label, no context. you just right. maybe, so you're just going on. What am I seeing? What am I smelling? What am I tasting? Yeah. Um, and for, and for me, what am I feeling? Cause a big part of how I taste wine is what I call like a palate feel. Of course. Of course. Um, and, um, and anyway, and then from there, you know, you're, again, this is all essay format, but you're expected to know things like, you know, vintage, certainly what grape variety is it region, um, quality level price, how is it made? And Whoa. then how would you sell this wine to a consumer? Like who's the right customer base for this, you know, all based on like what you're tasting in, in the glass. Now, how do they grade the test? Is it actually like, uh, missed uh, questions or because it being a lot of essay and stuff, how do they grade that test? Yeah, and it's a, uh, it's a really good question. So ultimately if you pass, you never see your exam. So, oh, oh really? No, but, but you do know because they will release later what the wines were. So like what I did every day, I walked out and you're just kind of in a brain fog because you're it's timed also. So you're like rushing and it's crazy and there's adrenaline. And so I wrote down what I had called each wine. Um, in that day. And then a couple of days later, they release it. So you can kind of know like, Hey, I got this number, right. You know, but ultimately each wine is weighted 25 points. And so again, you're kind of building your argument. Cause you could go in, let's say I was like, tasted it. I was like, you know what? I know that this is, this is a 2016, you know, Corton Charlemagne. And that's all I wrote. And I was right. I would fail. I would fail that question. Cause I didn't show my work. So right. you have to just kind of start with like, why do you think this back it up? You know, is it like something else that I could, could consider? And so you want it, you're showing that you understand the world of wine and then ultimately, okay, this is what I'm going to call, but based on what I'm tasting, I could have gone this way, but ultimately I'm going this way. And this is my final. Um, so, so there are ways also to pick up points and, and be wrong. Like you could still, if you like got really close, you got all the way down to like, this is either Albarino or Grunewaldner. And at the last minute I went Gruner and it was Albarino. You could still pick up points. But ultimately, you have to get most of the wines right. Yeah. Now, let, let, let me ask you this. We, we always hear about, you know, the million dollar bottle of wine or whatever, you know. And, yeah. and, and there was this uh, period where there were wines that were just a zillion dollars. I mean, I've been to restaurants and they come around. It is a 750 a glass. Yeah. And you're like, what? Yeah. What? Yeah. You know? Um, and there was that whole thing of like rare wines, like uh, cult wines. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and then I think, and this is me going back to the Coppola thing, there became these wines that were known as incredible that were like 30, $40 a bottle that people are like, this is, this is a whole new era yeah. of wine. What is a, a spectacular bottle of wine that's affordable and what is the most expensive wine you've ever drank oh man let me start with expensive i mean i have been lucky enough to try screaming eagle which can i mean and drc which can cost you know a car basically um what? now now i didn't buy this <laughs> oh yeah 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 we get it, we get it. yeah yeah i but always I'm, i always let people know that too they go hey, this fucking guy is rich he's like Nah, no. <laughs> even if I was, I wouldn't spend 10 grand on, you know, it's not to say, you know, but what, how much is Screaming Eagle? And was it a glass or did you drink a bottle? Uh, it was a, uh, I've been lucky enough to try a couple bottles over time. I think on release, it's close to maybe $2,000 now. But of course, if you get it on a restaurant or it's a library vintage, you're going to pay upwards of, you know, $10,000 easily. For the easily. bottle? Mm -hmm. For the bottle. And, mm -hmm. and, and then what do you like? Uh, what did you like about it? Was it, did you think it was worth it or were you like, Hmm, I love this question. Cause actually, um, uh, so it was beautiful bottle, but yeah. I think, I think what's interesting is these bottles, like, you know, again, this is a very known cult wine, right? The screaming Eagle, but we could be talking about other wines. We could be talking about Domingo de Romani Conti or something, but it, at some point, I believe it's, what does it mean to you? Right. You know, right because was it delicious? Oh my God. Yes. Right. Is it, 
$10,000 better than another bottle of wine, if it's worth it to you. Yeah. Of course. You know, course. so that's what I say. People are like, yeah. I got a fucking $20 watch. That's the same as yours. Like, yeah, well, that's not what it's about. You know, mm -hmm. that bottle yeah. of wine has soul. That thing has history that yeah. has that has, uh, you know, roots and and blood and sweat and stories, you know? Yeah. Same, same with some great watches or a great piece of denim or whatever. So, you know, where is the Screaming Eagle made? Uh, it's in Oakville. So it's a winery in Oakville. They do not let you visit. Really? Why? Hard as you. Oh, they're well, they're they're very small production, first of all, but um, they would just get inundated again. And it's too expensive, you know, yeah, to, yeah. to to pour those bottles. But but yeah, no, I think you're right. Like, what is it worth to you? And then also, like, who are you with? Oh, you yeah. know, how yeah. are you feeling? Like, what memory do you have of it? Um, and like you asked me about like this champagne I'm drinking right now is it's like $30. It's basically a $30 champagne, which for champagne is not that expensive. I love this, you know, right. like. But, but I, ha but there's a, like, for me, I know this producer, there's a story. It means something to me because I look at this bottle and I remember visiting and meeting the owners and their cat. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know? and, yeah. He, and the guy had dropped a bottle right before I got there. And so his shirt was wet and it's like all that stuff that you look at it. And I think it's the same with music, right? Like yeah. do you sometimes just hear something and it's like instantly you're like in a different place in a different time you're with that person and who are they yeah. wearing or, yeah. You know, well, that's what music is to most people. You know, whenever mm -hmm. somebody says there's no good music anymore, I realize they don't really care about uh, seeking out new music. Music to them is a time machine back to when they didn't have bills or a mortgage, maybe, or, or a divorce. It yeah. takes them back to the, you know, I was single. We were in a Camaro. We we're, you know, driving around, smoking joints. That's what music is. It can take you all over. Yeah. And that's what that's what wine can do. And uh and, 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 you know, wine is right now a lot like the coffee world. There was some click uh, a while ago where everyone got into coffee and wine. And I love coffee. And, you know, yeah, I drink a Starbucks because it's everywhere, you know, but do I like it? No, it's just what I do. But, you know, once I started drinking some great, great coffees, and I just love Blue Bottle, which is a fantastic coffee. I don't put anything in my coffees. And I think a lot of people do because it tastes like shit and they're trying to dilute it. But if I go to a Blue Bottle and get a nice uh, cappuccino or Americano, I drink that thing just straight. It tastes like a mocha kind of chocolatey, deep, deep, deep coffee. And I love that kind of stuff. So I can relate to the wine people because I understand what it's all about. You yeah. Know? I have a question for you, actually. So, you know, there's been um, a lot of things written about this wine culture in, in the NBA, let's say, you know, it's, um, Baxter Holmes wrote something uh, uh, about like all these, you know, famous players and they have these like wine clubs and they bring the wine on the plane afterward. And they're all kind of like, who can one up each other? And it's like a real thing. And right. what is it like, do you see that, let's say either with comedians or I know you, you know, you're all around these like amazing bands, Metallica, Greta Van Fleet, these guys, yeah. like, do, do you see any of that there? Well, I think the interesting thing in the world uh, that really blows my mind is there's a thing where people start to make money and the fans can turn on them like, look at these bougie fucking asshole. They want you to be blue collar for life. Mm -hmm. And I don't think people understand, say like me, who grew up, uh, uh, you know, food stamp, single mom, terrible, no money. Uh, yeah. I think that people don't understand if you, you know, work your ass off and get to somewhere, you start to learn about great stuff. Mm -hmm. May it be wine or cars or, or, you know, a, a, a place to go skiing and Swiss Alps or, you know, whatever it is. And, you know, and you start to lose your mind like, wow. And what I see with the people that start to make money, other cool people come around like, look, I met you guys and you, 
you share each other's knowledges yeah. and you learn and you seek out like, why do people smoke these cigars? Okay, Cuban, you know, I went to Honduras. Mm -hmm. I saw him hand roll these cigars out in the you know jungle. And I started to understand that. I don't smoke cigars, but I still wanted to understand that. So you learn fine stuff. You know, and in a lot of people's uh, minds, it's just like overpriced. You're an idiot and all this instead of like, good for you. You're seeking out uh, a better, you know, you know, like, look, I love mac and cheese and top ramen. I grew up on it, but I also love caviar or something, you know, that Wolfgang Puck brought over that I would never buy. I don't know anything about it, but you try and you go, whoa, what yeah. is this? You know, so I think. I think that the people that start to make there, there's two types of, uh, of, of fame levels. There's one that's just kind of white trash forever. They're like, we booze, we made money. Blah, blah. And then there's that kind of other where they're like, I want to seek out what life is. And the, yeah. the, it is in there in the rock and roll world. I know Kirk Hammett and uh, Lars, you know, Lars mm -hmm. was into fine art. Uh, you know, probably because he had a European uh, upbringing. I loved art, you know, painters seeking out why are these painters the greatest, you know, go to the Louvre, learn that kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, Kirk Hammett into fine fashion. I love fashion. You know, why is this crazy good money? Who are the greats in the fashion world? All of that, you know, so there are people in bands that they seek out stuff because they're around fashion. They're around different types of uh, people that make money and, right. uh, and, and and wealth and culture and stuff. And it's and it, I tell, I think to me, it's really about life seeking out as much cool stuff as you can before you die. You know? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, I um, co-host on a podcast called Wine Access Unfiltered. And the whole premise of that is to have people who are extremely successful in their own industry, but are not in the wine industry. So, you know, we've got musicians, comedians, um, philanthropists, CEOs, um, uh, you know, economic people. It's, it's been like, uh, uh, economists. I mean, it's been really interesting to talk to them and, but there have been a number of comedians. So like Steve Byrne was on, right. uh, Bert Kreischer, uh, Tom Papa. Yeah. And, and so that, that's kind of what, it, what made me think of it. Cause like, um, just wondering if there's, there's sort of this building of, of wine curiosity among that, uh, that field as well. Absolutely. I, I believe that, you know, um, there's comedians out there that, like I said, you travel around, you get to a city and whoever they kind of, uh, you know, hit people in that town. If you're a, a, a rising star and the buzz is out on you. They end up in the green room and look, that's how I, I meet people all the time. Uh, you know, you're like, oh, oh, hey, you know, like I'm out with Bill and, and Bill Burr and different people come down and or if I was traveling with the Stones or whatever, you, you start to meet people. And uh, after the show, maybe they drink some wine, they have a cigar or they go and have some incredible food at whatever the great restaurant is in that city. There's nothing more I like doing. Then after the show, people are like, dude, you want to meet us at this bar? I'm like, oh, no, I, that's the last thing I want to do. It's loud and people yeah. are screaming and I want to go eat a fine meal and um, and talk to people that aren't comics and see what they do and what this city's about and and uh, what's your your great restaurant and everything. So, yeah, there's definitely people out there that are into good wines and uh, and, and and everything, cars and you know, I mean, there's comedians that are way into like we were talking about going out to uh, Pebble Beach or, yep. and quail and all that. And there's people that are way into, you know, fine, fine stuff. And, you know, you can see it around. I, I mean, comedians now, the big, big, big ones are making more money than than ever. <laughs> you, got, you, you know, so. Yeah the sky's kind of the limit of learning yeah. and, and enjoying stuff. I mean, there's only so many times you can have a Jack and Coke before you go <laughs> like, well, what else is out there? You know? Yeah, for sure. But I, I love what you said though, about like sort of bring like meeting at the table and having food, because really that's, that's what mine, wine is meant to do, right? Bring people yeah. together, inspire conversation. We don't have to agree, but you know, 
um, you know, and you loosen up a little bit too. And, and, um, you know, who, who knows what happens next, but, and, but, and I like that especially too, because again, I think that wine, and this is something that I really try to, to work on as someone who's in the industry, like something like a classical music has this sort of perceived barrier to entry, right? Absolutely. So like, Absolutely. Like, I don't know anything about it, so I can't. It costs it. a lot of money. Right. You know? A lot of people think that, ah, wine, it costs a lot of money. There was that thing for years. Yeah. Wine costs a lot of money. And uh, a lot like watches. People are like, ah, watches, you know, they cost a lot of money. I, I, you know, it's not, there's all kinds of different levels of fine stuff, you know? Well, for sure. And it goes back to what we were talking about originally, which is like, who's going to judge? No one's going to judge you on what you're feeling. Right. So, like, you know, you, you go to a concert, you may not have ever heard, you know, an opera before, but if you dig it great, if you don't, that's fine too. Like it's your body, it's your ears and eyes and, you know, and like, same with wine. It's like, you, you know, if it, it, it's meant to be enjoyed and you don't have to have some, you know, level of knowledge or be able to pronounce every single word that's on the label or, you know, blind taste it, but, um, it's meant to be enjoyed. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, like you guys were sitting there talking about wine and, uh, I don't drink wine, but I still was fascinated to hear. I want to know what the best is in everything in life. What's yeah. the best wine? What's the best car? What's the best hotel to stay at? What's the best suit to get? What's the best glasses to wear? You know, I just like to know fine, fine. And usually the best, it doesn't mean the most expensive. I would say 99% of the time, the best means something that, uh, somebody put their heart and soul into. Yeah. You know, usually there's no corporation involved in it and there's no uh, it's always a family. There's always got a story. This dude moved from such and such with seven dollars, you know, planted yeah. one uh, grapevine and he may stomped it himself and sold it. And, and then a family drank it and provided money for him. And you're like, oh, yeah, tell me more about this guy. You know? Yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> it's cool that you say that because um, because at our dinner, of course, you know, you and Reiner, you're talking cars and I don't really know much. about. It. Well, when I say much, I know nothing. Right? Yeah. But but I was like, wow, this is actually similar conversations because you're talking about these people who put like their heart and their soul and their blood and their sweat. And there's like so many details that I would never have thought of that go into it. And, and yeah, it's similar. So it was like, I know you're like, oh, this is boring for you. And I was like, hell no. Like, this is yeah. fascinating. Cause like, I know all the things you're talking about. I could describe like what happens in wine, but you're speaking a language that I'm not familiar with, but there's clearly so much passion around it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And another thing really wild about, uh, grapes and, and wine is like, uh, coffee and cigars, nature is, oh, is yeah. the is the boss so nature lets you know if you're going to make money this year or not which is the scariest thing ever with automobiles or watches it's you and metal and you know the, you're yeah. just making it but with with stuff like coffee wine and cigars you are like oh no we had a fire no mm -hmm. wine this year Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's just one of the that's a, a low tragedy in what happened up there because people lost their homes yes. and it's horrific. But still, uh, when when families put all their their they all their money is needed, you know, from this yeah. crop or they might not stay in business, you could have a history go away, a hundred year history in the stroke of nature, you know? Oh, Yeah especially what's going on right now with global warming and the fires and everything wines could be gone, you know? Yeah. There's a lot of talk about that, of course, because, because it is, this is agriculture. I mean, as much as we're talking about, you know, luxury brands and, you know, the sort of sexiness and romance, like it's, it's farming. And so, yeah. And you can, you only have one shot, right. Cause you only get to harvest once a year. So you can also, you can spend your whole year and in a day, you could have frost or hail or a fire or something like that. And it's just like, well, got to wait till next year, you know, <laughs> brutal, brutal, yeah, brutal. Yeah. And you got to have enough money in the bank to make it through that year, you know? Exactly. Yeah. So you pass the course, you become a wine master. Mm -hmm. And what happens with you next? Because of course we met at a, uh, the, the Michelin star, you know, hand mm -hmm. out to uh, Wolfgang, his second one. Congrats to him. 
how do you get to where you are now? You pass this and where, where do you go with that? You go, all right, I'm a wine master. Who needs me? What do you do? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Well, it's kind of what you make of it. So, you know, I will say it definitely, I mean, it, it definitely makes it easier, you know, open some doors for conversations. And, um, but I kept my job. I had this, I have the same job I had before I became a master of wine. Um, but for me, it's, you know, it, it was something I did for myself, you know, not necessarily because I was trying to get to the next level of my career. It's, you know, but I will say it almost, it allows for more learning. And that's what goes back to like, why I did in the first place. It's like, I can't sit still. Right. So like now what I think of it is not like, Oh, Hey, I'm a master of wine. Like it's, you know, look at me. It's like, Hey, I'm a master of wine. Can I come talk to you? Like, let's have a conversation about what you're doing. Cause I really want to know. And, you know, it's kind of gives you, you know, it shows that you put the work in. You right. Know? Um, right. so for me, respect. It's, almost, it's like yeah. a respect right away. Yeah. yeah. So, but, um, but yeah, you know, I see some people certainly will kind of, ch- you know, try to change careers or whatever, but it's, there's th- the thing about the master of wine, there's people who pass, who are, are winemakers, who are writers, um, you know, who are, you know, I work for a retailer. So it's kind of all different types of people. And I have to say for the most part, the people that I know, um, from the program have, have kind of kept doing what they're doing just, you know, they did it for themselves. And it's, I have to say one of the best things about it actually is the people that I've met. So it's a, it's so brutal. (laughs) The study program, you get knocked down so many times and like, there's no quota though. So you're not competing against the number of people that are taking the exam that you're, you're only competing against yourself. Right. So there's a real camaraderie among, among us. Um, I mean, my study group, they will be my, my friends for life. And, you know, we saw each other at our absolute worst and, you know, and at our best. And so there, it just builds this feeling of like, I have no inhibitions around them because they really, they know who I am. They saw me answer something and look like a complete idiot, you know, and then maybe the next week I had the best week of anyone in our study group, you know? And so, but we, we saw that about everybody. So that's, that's been like, a just a, one of the most surprising and wonderful takeaways. Have you been to Bottle Rock and uh, are you excited for this year's Bottle Rock? Let's talk I'm, a little bit about that. I'm really excited. So I am going to completely embarrass myself and say that I, I live right here in Napa and I've never been, but wow. my house <laughs> or my former house, um, it was right above, there's a little neighborhood there called Alta Heights. It's right above the fairgrounds. And so I basically could sit outside and like, listen to, to all the shows. I remember the first year it was like Black Keys, yeah. um, Alabama Shakes. Uh, right. It was amazing. I was just like sitting outside. Um, but I, this year I would love to go because Metallica is playing. Yeah. 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 You got to yeah. go. Are you going to go? I'm going to go. Well, we're going to meet there. Right. We already, yep. we already decided. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I love, uh, I, I, I love the, <clears throat> it's, it, I love the, the, uh, juxtapose of bottle rock, you know, it's yeah. like, you know, I get to see people out there, mm, yeah, try this one. And then they're up there like, I'm creeping death. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you've got like Chef Morimoto doing like a sushi demonstration over here. And then, yeah, you got Greta and Van Fleet playing over here. And yeah, yeah. It's, it's, yeah. Pretty, it's pretty wild. So, yeah, I mean, for sure, you're going to be there. So we'll, we're going. <laughs> so how does it uh, how do you hook up with the Michelin and start with Ryan and stuff? Do you travel with him when he hands out the stars or what were you doing? Because you were there. Yeah. So, so, um, the company I work for wine access, so we're the official wine provider of the Michelin guide. So we're partners with them and we, we actually have a subscription, um, where you get, a, a five shipments a year of four different bottles of wine. And each of those is focused on a different Michelin restaurant. So, um, I work with the wine director or the sommelier. And basically it's like, if you were going to be in this restaurant, if you were going to go to per se, let's say, which was our, our holiday shipment, what are four bottles that you might have if, if you go there, but you get shipped right to your home and wow. then, you know, with recipes and, and all that. So I was in LA because, um, our first quarter shipment this year is, um, with chef Gary Menes of Le Comptoir, which is a one-star Michelin. It's in a, it's basically in like Koreatown and it has, I think it's either eight or 10 seats. That's it. So oh, yeah. teeny like counter, um, uh, service, but, uh, amazing food. And so I went down there and filmed some videos with him. So we were talking about his food and the wines that we selected for the, for the shipment. And then of course, Ryan was down there giving out Michelin stars. So met up with him and I thought that was so cool. You, you weren't there in time to see, uh, see them get a cut, but you know, just like seeing someone who 
has that achievement and is rewarded for all their hard work. And like every single person was there in the restaurant, you know, from the front of the house, back of the house, and just like seeing the look on their faces was like, I would be a fly on the wall any day if I get to see things like that. Oh, it was an amazing night. It was, it really was amazing night. It's uh, some of those things I've, I've felt lucky in life of being included on stuff like that. Yeah. Where you're sitting down with the guy who is basically one of the greatest chefs ever and just hearing the stories and, and, and he's not jaded. He's not burnt out. He's just, just festive, you know, yeah. you're like, God, this guy made it, you know, how hard it, it's almost impossible for a restaurant to make it Yeah, almost yeah. impossible. And uh, there he was just stars in his eyes. Just, just great. And we were eating some insane food, man. Oh, what was yeah. your favorite, man? I, 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 it was unbelievable. I thought that bone in New York was unreal. That was of the steaks we had. That was my favorite, but I don't know if you remember towards the beginning, there was the oyster with oh, yeah. ca caviar. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Cause like, I mean, how can you go wrong with two things? in one yeah. bite like that so. and those squid rolls oh yeah. oh my yeah. god <laughs> but i have to tell you i i can't i can't keep up like by the last course there i was just like like holding up a white napkin like I, I got oh i was done too <laughs> i was like oh i i got in the car you know and i was like oh i you know, I had my leather jacket. I was like, this is out of here. I got home and I laid down right away. I mean, I don't eat that bit. That, look, I'll eat a good meal, but not that. I mean, it just kept coming and coming. Yeah. And Ryan's like, yeah, we have to eat it. We don't want to show disrespect. And I'm like, yeah, dude, there's three of us here. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I can't even move right now. I know. Oh my God. It was a great night. And it was so cool to meet you Likewise. and it's great to talk to you about wine and, uh, and get that out there. What is the website real quick for people to go to? Oh, wineaccess.com. And yeah. then your podcast, what's it called? Uh, wine access unfiltered. And so you can find us in all the normal places, you know, iTunes, Spotify, et cetera. Yeah. 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 And thank you so much for doing the show. Thank and you. It was great to meet you. I hope to see you at Bottle Rock for sure. And if you are in uh, Los Angeles, come see some comedy or if I'm up in San Fran, like we said before, and I'm doing comedy, you got to come see that. You a big comedy fan? I love it. You know it. I will be there because I've never seen you live. So yeah. it's, it's top of my list. Yeah. I think Marin's coming to uh, Son uh, Sonoma or Napa here in a couple of weeks. Right on. All yeah, right. Yeah. I'll have to check it out. Oh, yeah. yeah. You'll love that. All right. Thank you so much for doing the show. Thank and, you, Dean. Uh, <laughs> great to have you on. And uh, oh, you got an Instagram? I do. I'm my, I'm just Vanessa Conlon, my name. I didn't get fancy. And then at Wine Access, if you want to follow that. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you for doing the show. Thanks, Dean. Cheers. <laughs> have a great week, huh? You too. See you later.